coming in at 6.30. If you could give us uh, the, yeah, the questions on NIMS. Um, but I guess if you want to start into the budget. I want everybody to know I wasn't trying to be a jerk. I'm just trying to get the most money we can out of this piece of property. All right. Did you put a, I'm sorry. Did you put a date on that when we're going to open the bids? First, first meeting. You did? First meeting in March. Thanks. Whatever date that is. And I'll have a notice of intent to sell municipal real estate for us to sign at, uh, I think the plan is to have a budget meeting next week. Uh, so I'll have that notice for us to sign next week. So if we can publish and get everything right off kind of immediately. Rick? March 1st is a Uh First meeting, not first meeting. Not the meeting on the first. So if March 1st is a Sunday, that means the second, second is our, our first meeting. Yeah, we may not meet that day. It'd be a day before town meeting. Oh, good point. You might want to wait. Well, yeah, we usually meet the Wednesday after town meeting but to do appointments. Whenever our first meeting is, that's true. We usually do appointments. We could do a, this auction or open the sealed bids. That wouldn't take very long. Yeah. On the 14th of March? Oh, on the, uh, that would be March 4th. Okay, March 4th. Wednesday. Okay. The appointment meeting. Uh, regardless, it will be our first meeting in March. Okay. So... Is it your understanding that to decide the taxes that somebody has to pay the um, lot rent and the lot rent's not owned by the people that were there? It attaches somehow to this? I believe so. That's the advice we've received. I would think the lot rent would go to the person that the contract was with. That was what I, that was what I believe, but that's counter to the advice that I've received. Hmm. You're not buying the, the lot rent. You're buying the actual property itself. Yep. So I don't think we should have even been liable for it. the previous lot rent. I think we could have been liable for the uh, lot rent after the town assumed ownership, but I don't think the town should have to pay that before that. Well, we didn't. We've been paying since we took possession. Okay. And it's been... It's to the tune of a thousand dollars, just over a thousand that we've already paid in lot rent. Okay. So really, I don't think the new owner is responsible for the previous lot rent. That would have to be negotiated between the owner and the new yeah. owner and the owner of the trailer park. Yeah. Okay. Rick, are you here for the budget discussion or? Sure. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, that's where we are now. You want to? So some of the highlights in the budget are I have worked in uh, an amount to be a uh, 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 fund to reduce taxes. Um, that money is coming from two places. It's fifteen thousand dollars coming from the. Uh, Estimated surplus for the 1920 financial year. And then it's 37500 coming from the historical society's uh, contribution for the uh, remaining balance on the Holcomb House. Where is that? Uh, though Where is that it that? is combined on line uh, 118. Excuse me, 117. Oh, okay, the estimated balance. So the 52,000? Yes, 52,500. Okay, and that is, you said? 15,000 from uh, the estimated surplus of 1920. Okay. And uh, half of 75,000, so that's 37,500. Uh, from historical society contribution.
And that's what made the big difference in the amount to be raised by taxes? Yes. Reduction? Okay. The amount to be raised by taxes right now stands at a 2.3% over our 1920 budget. And if you recall, we had a, an article uh, to hire a part-time recreation coordinator. Mm -hmm. That article raised the amount to be, ra the, the amount of taxes to raise by an additional uh, roughly 40,000. Uh, so that our actual amount to be raised by taxes in the 1920 budget year was the $1,864,505 that you see on the 1920 end of year. So our actual is uh, a reduction. We have a, we currently have a small reduction in the amount of taxes to be raised next year. Hmm. That's good news. Yeah. How do we get from there from the picture last year? The biggest change is the uh, contribution of the Historical Society and the surplus money. That in previous drafts, I hadn't estimated yet any, any cash to reduce taxes. So 52.5 does move that, that percentage? I thought we went from 9 to... Uh, uh, that's not all of it. I'll go through a couple other areas. 8.3. That, 8.3. Eight that's where we are now? And, no, that's what it was last week. Oh, yeah. We yeah. still don't have a, an no, answer from the attorney. You, that's too far. No, we don't. <laughs> so we still have 116,000 out there somewhere. That... Uh, we actually have more than that. We've got uh, the... Estimated surplus for this year is a total of thirty-one thousand. I think thirty-one thousand six hundred sixty-four dollars. I'm without the attorney's answer about our uh, using that money to go into reserve funds. I'm not sure if that's going to have to go into our total or not. So the, this. Could Depending on his answer, this we could tweak this again. Um, uh, the where, places where we've seen uh, spending reductions has been uh, we got the final figure for our passive, uh, which is line. General Insurance Line 158. And we saw almost $10,000 reduction there from the estimate to the actual. How were we that far off? Uh, because we didn't have any numbers from them at that point. That was just a placeholder that I had picked a placeholder that was over what we were going to pay. Okay. So that we weren't going to get bad news once we got the actual numbers in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. When we got actual numbers like now, it was going to be good news no matter what. Uh, the degree to which it would be good news is. But it does look like it's the third year, the second year to row that insurances are down. That kind of insurance from sixty thousand dollars in seventeen eighteen. Yes. To fifty three fifty four thousand now. Uh, we can credit a significant amount of that to our uh, experience modifiers, what they call it at uh, VLCT. Uh, what that means is that we have a good record of safety, and so our the longer we go without having an accident, uh, we see greater reductions in our insurance. Very nice. So where did we get the estimate that we used when we were jointly meeting with the trustees uh, for choosing health plan? 
Or, or uh, th this is our town insurance, not just the town employees town. insurance. Okay. okay. This is a passive, the property and casualty intermunicipal fund. Okay. Okay. Um, it doesn't have all the health insurance. No, okay. it's uh, it does cover workers' comp, or it does include workers' comp, but that's the only way it relates to employees. Uh, so that was a good, that was good news. Uh, we were able to increase the, sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. We were able to increase a little bit of what we're taking in in town clerk's fees. The town clerk received a uh, fee increase this year. So that rose a little bit since last time. Uh, we tweaked and got a little bit more detail on um, maybe we should stop paying the electric bill. Yeah. <laughs> Don is the only person we can see. Yeah, no. <laughs> She's in the spotlight. Through a nickel and dime with Brian Krause in the yeah. way, right? So you're saying there's yep. no taxes this year? Uh, this is a change. So what did you put on the down to? Uh, there is no change. There will. Uh, I'll get to that, Mike. Okay. Um, Eric, to answer your question, the the yeah, I spent a lot of time with Brian Krause, and we. Tightened the uh, highway budget. They had seen a a pretty good increase this year, uh, so we've tightened that up considerably. And he's <coughs> comfortable with not going to the math like you mean. So. Basically, uh, we are still in the position with our paving budget uh, where we're. We're maintaining. Uh, we're not, if we want to pave more roads, if we want to improve access, uh, we're going to have to make some changes there. The, the, this is, it, we're paying maintenance money for our roads. Okay. Well, maybe there's a place where we can justify spending a little more money. Current budget. What line is that? Uh, the paving in particular would be oh, line. Uh, Three fifty nine. Oh. So those are paving capital expenses and. and uh, when we're at capital expenses, right now our capital expenses are uh, major repaving projects. So, you know, when we're uh, cutting a road down and resurfacing it, not just patching, but taking it down to some degree, uh, grinding it off and repaving over it. When we pay for, you know, when we get behind on paving, it seems to me we end up spending more in the long run, and it's an added expense to um, residents who have to pay extra in car maintenance because, you know, it's not good on vehicles. So, so suggestion maybe that we a little more in that since we're having it. Yeah, but what would be the next size project that we're, is there something we're putting off? There's nothing in particular, well, it's not quite true. Plot Road is waiting for us to either receive a grant or make a pretty significant contribution. That the yeah. repaving on Plot Road is going to be a pretty we suspect it's going to be a pretty major project. We don't think that the 
uh, roadbed underneath is in good condition, we think that we're going to have to take up the road um, uh, entirely. Uh, and you now that that's going to be a, a very significant project. What about hogback? How is that holding up, and when's the last time we top coated that? It's been a while since we've done a shim coat on, on uh, hogback. I have because we put a lot of money into that road. We don't want to lose it. No, it's a pretty good shape, actually. Is it? I believe that it is. I, I haven't been out there too recently. Uh, that last coat they put on it was like microscopic, but yeah. that's kind of worn off. Underneath is pretty good shape. Yeah, I don't. I drove it after the flooding in November, and as I recall, it was in decent shape. But it's something that uh, we could come back to. We we probably will finalize the budget next Monday, and we'll know from the attorney on that hundred and sixteen thousand what we can and can't do with it. Yep. Um, and that may determine what we might. Bump up a little bit, but some areas that I think it's duly noted where it could be bumping up is the paving, but there may be some other areas that if we were to bump something up. Yep. Um, the other thing we do want to caution about is a significant amount of our. Uh, the, the amount that we are being forgiven on and able to reduce taxes is by contribution. It's not, it's one time money. It's not, we're, we're seeing a pretty significant windfall uh, and not a sustainable trend. Right. Is this a good breaking point? I think so. Okay. Scott, uh, thank you for coming in. We, we, uh, you know, there is a significant increase in NEMS, and the board was just curious. Uh, we understood this. Uh, a drive, one of the drivers in it was, was switching from a calendar to a fiscal year, as well as some other. Or we, we've always been on a calendar year, and so what we do, so what we've been doing is. Like in 2019, our calendar year, um, we had in there $307,391 for town appropriations. We actually received less than that because that $307,000 was for July 1st to June 30th, 19, or 18, 19. So that's always setting us back a little bit. So, <clears throat> but this year, have you seen the budget that I sent Ryan on Friday? Yes. Yes. Uh, that's in your report packet. Okay. So this year we're asking for our calendar year 2020, we're asking for 327.780, which for calendar year is roughly $20,000 increase. But in order to get that 327, for, because this year, 2020, from January 1st to June 30th, we're receiving half of the 307, 391. And then from, if I get, gotta give my dates right, January, um, from July 1st to December 31st, we received half of the 327.780, which um, comes up to the 327.780 um, total. But in order, excuse me, in order to do that, we have to charge you this year 348.145 between the five towns. So that's actually an increase of 41,000 down to 20,000. But what that does, it gives us an automatic increase for the 2021 budget of 
So that's going to, that 20 for that lesson is going to be made up. So next year we should, as long as we're having a good year this year, call by anyways, <clears throat> we should be in very good shape. The other thing this year, our call volume was down. You should probably have that in your report as well. Um, we are down from 1,503 to 1,456 calls. Typical call is about $1,000 in income, some more, some less. So between those two, attributed to the increase, or the, the loss and the increase. We are working um, and expanding our territory, we hope. We are actually also working on contracts um, for transports, um, nursing homes and everything. So instead of just calling Coffee Hospital, the call goes out to whoever's available, we automatically get called directly. So that would increase our call volume as well. So we're trying, but Geographically, it's tough um, because we're in a very small area. We have eight, eighty-two hundred dollar, eighty-two hundred residents between the five towns, and the calls right now are, looks like they're going to stay around that fifteen hundred. Um, we do four thousand calls out of Newport, and that brings the cost to the communities way, way down because we're doing it with about the same number of people that we have here. One thing that we have been able to do, um, you will see that your administrative costs are going down because what we look at it each year, we just added five towns, I think, in the Newport area. And because of that, the proportion of administrative expense, we didn't have to add any people. We just um, divvied up equally between the two based upon our income. And so, because this is now a much smaller um, center than Newport is, Newport is, we have, you have less administrative expense. So as we grow that region, it saves you money here. But we really need to grow here. And surrounding towns, if they would look at what it costs them, they would believe that regional is the way to go. They just don't have enough calls and they're paying an awful lot of money for what they're doing. I mean, Cambridge has roughly 300 calls a year and they're trying to maintain full-time staff and, have, and two ambulances. And, and so their costs are extraordinary. So as you add, if you're able to add talent, do you add ambulances? We would have to. I think we've got seven in Newport now, four down here. Where is the opportunity for growth? Cambridge seems to want to maintain its own. Morrisville seems to want to maintain its own. There is presently, um, we are talking to Cambridge but that would be for administration only. They still are interested in keeping their own base. Um, it, I don't know if it's going to work out because of the call volume. Um, or the, thing, the key thing would be to have regional system. And Wolka, they probably use. Wolka is with Hardwick. Hardwick. Yes. Greensboro is with Hardwick. We do respond to Greensboro Nursing Home. Um, and then that's it, and then Stowe, right. which is, they need their own service. They, I mean, small population, but quite a few people in town. Mm -hmm. So, what's your theory on calls decreasing? Calls decreasing is, um, I think we're losing population. We're not here this year in the census. Uh, but the, even if the calls stay the same, well, this year it was basically, well, the call, our 911 calls increased to the communities. Mm -hmm. Transports 
decreased. We have a lot more people trying to get into healthy new transports this year because they need the income as well. So we've worked on that. We can't get every transport. We can't be everything to everybody. There's going to be times when our crews are out and we can't. If we can work on scheduling transports, which would do a better job at Newport Hospital and Copley, then we can bring crews in so we don't lose those. We are going to lose some. We just can't afford to have enough people sitting up there for everything that happens. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so the transports and Morrisville really got their act together this year. Um, previously, they were having some difficulty and we were responding to a lot of calls there. We still responded to quite a few, but not nearly what we have in the past. Mm -hmm. What's Morrisville's cost per population? They're around $78 for a year, around $37. Cambridge in the same. Cambridge, I haven't got the exact figures because they own their building. They own their ambulances. Oh. So you'd have you'd have to take that into fact. You can't just look at what they're paying year to year. Yeah, I also wonder if this isn't a symptom of a greater issue just with our health care in general. I mean, I know for my family alone, there was two times we probably should have called an ambulance, but we thought twice about it because of the expense. I'm sure there are some people so that do. I just, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think people are thinking, I know people are thinking twice about it. As, as they do, if even going to the doctor, unfortunately. Oh, yes, of course. So I'm just saying that, you know, is there anything that, as an organization, you're doing to, to you know, in Montpelier or further well, for Well, the key thing is um, reimbursements for Medicare. Yeah. we talking to Montpelier all the time. Vermont Ambulance Association works on that as well. Um, we're getting about 60 cents on the dollar. And we're getting more and more of those calls simply because the population of the area and of the state is aging. And if we have Medicare for all, it's going to really hurt. Uh, because every call would be, we'd get 60 cents on the dollar and then the taxpayers, unfortunately, would have to make up for that. Is there a certain percentage of people who you, who you go pick up at their home to take them to the hospital that have, have no insurance? There must be that. I don't have those figures. Um, there is obviously some. I think it's fewer than there has been in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're not going to change that. No. Well, I was just Unfortunately. Wondering. Our biggest thing is um, non transports. We get a lot of calls where somebody has fallen out of bed. We pick them up and put them back in bed, and mm. we can't bill for that unless we take them somewhere. Oh, I see. Okay. If we go, we go to a car accident, we go to a fire, no transports, no income. Well, it doesn't make any sense. State law. Unless we transport and take somebody to a hospital or back to a nursing home or somewhere. But you perform the service, but you don't get paid for it. Well, most of them, we don't perform the service. All we do is show up. Okay. Because I think your fire department probably gets automatically called for car accidents. Yeah. You know, Hyde Park does. And um, dispatches going to always be very conservative. And if they don't really know what's going on, they're going to get us on the road. Mm -hmm. As they should. But your costs there are essentially fuel to get you there and back, right? Because your people are. Right. But it also could be potentially a loss of another call. If we have another call at the same time and yeah. the ambulance is out, somebody helps us to cover it. I would say that doesn't happen often, but it's always a potential. I think the service is terrific. You messed up to the presentation. We're trying, yeah. um, but it is hard, and we will continue to try. 
when people forget is if we had to stay with the water ambulance, where would we be today? Well, we've been this 16 years ago. They came to you, to us, I should say, at 225,000, and we're asking for 347 16 years later. Mm -hmm. well, I would guess most services have probably doubled in 16 years. And now, of course, it's a for profit organization. So. Right. We are a private nonprofit. Unfortunately, we did have reserve funds to take care of this loss this past year. Anybody have any further questions? Do you sort of understand why we're asking for the 347 with the three, instead of the 320? That should definitely help in the future. Do you expect it to be a one year adjustment to get us? Because then we'll be on that cycle that continually thereafter. Thanks for coming in, Scott. Thanks for doing everything you do. Go ahead and take care of your cold. Sure. Got to get up to four and be on the road to five. Thank you. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Take care. You too. Um, I guess before we go in, we got to wait 10 minutes before we go into our regular meeting. Was there anything in, else in this budget that you wanted to share or go over? I was. I was just going to ask if you've made any of the adjustments to the uh, capital equipment uh, plan that we had talked about. Uh, no adjustments to the plan. Um, it's still in our current budget estimate. Uh, we're kind of waiting on decision and advice from our attorney before I set that. Uh, but that's going to be the kind of deciding factor about how we handle that. What happens to the second 37.5? Uh, unless we do something else with it, it will go in to reduce taxes. Uh, well, it'll, it depends a little bit on our agreement with the Historical Society about when we receive that money. But the idea being that we would receive the money at, uh, you know, kind of the easiest way to handle it is July 1st of uh, 2020 so that it goes right into this budget. And then July 1st of 2021 would go right into the next year's budget. How did we leave that? They were going to make a proposal? But they're going to create the signable document okay. and bring it back did, to us. Have you shared with them that where, when we wanted it? Because I don't, I think we shared with them in our motion, we wanted it two payments, but we don't want it until July 1st, right? I thought we said we were taking the 37.5 now and 37.5 July 1st. Me too. Well, that would, and then there was discussion about that, how that would work. And because my kid, first motion was to have us uh, take the money now. And then you had said that we ought to break it up for you know, the evenness of tax purposes. And then the discussion, uh, so I said, it, it got amended to take half immediately and half July 1st. And then we had a discussion later, I thought, that said that it's not going to make any difference uh, with referral. You know, that's you guys, but you know more about that, well, if, that evenness. If we just don't, if we receive it in FY21 and we want to apply it to FY22, all we have to do is not spend it in FY21, and then any money not spent rolls over and is returned to the taxpayer in the following year. So if we just don't spend it, it, it we'll get it the following year as a reduction in taxes. Yeah. And the upshot of, it, of another slant on this was that Dunk and I were supposed to take the propo that proposal and we were supposed to add the signature points to that. Yep. And that we haven't done yet, but I, I believe we're getting the money as soon as this year and July 1. And that was your recollection? Do you remember? Did you write that down, Don? Um, I wrote some stuff down. I, I, 
probably want to look at it before saying for sure what you guys. I mean, I'm not. I don't. Not sure. I think in the minutes it just reflected two separate payments, fifty percent. It yeah, didn't exactly. say that's one. What the motion was, and then there was discussion later about you know the kind of stuff Doug was just saying. I don't think there was a point where anybody said this is what we definitely want to do. Uh, that's how I recall the discussion. Also, is that we we talked about a couple options, but that the motion was just that it would be in two payments. In two payments, yes, but I thought it was now and next time. That was a discussion. We talked about that, but that wasn't part of the motion. Because if you do it now and sometime after July 1st, you might as well take it all now. That's what we, that's what we came to. Yeah. But if we did the, the payments scheduled on July 1st, 2020, in July 1st, 2021, it would be in two separate budget, fiscal budgets, and we can show them in the budget. As if yeah. we took it all now, it would be advantageous to us, wouldn't it? For a one year blip, yeah. But right. then we but would have be, to make it up next it be, year. Well, true, but it would be good for this year's tax, this, this coming tax. Right. The taxpayers would see a reduction this year, and then they got to make it up next year. Not if we didn't spend half of it. We've got to do something for this 7.4 percent here that we've got to take. The amount to be collected by taxes is less in this fiscal budget than the current year. It was 8.3 last time. Now it's down to 7.4. That's the budget. Right. The budget. Look at the number that's collected by taxes. And that's it's that's less. the uh, total amount of money we're going to spend. Is uh, is up. Uh, uh, but that's grant money, that's everything. Yeah. So what's the bottom line for the tax increase? The bottom line is there is not a tax increase it's a if decrease. everything on this holds. It would actually be a decrease of less than a penny. Okay, because I, I showed you that initially and you said no. I thought you were asking me if the taxes, I thought the increase is zero. I thought you were asking me if the taxes themselves were zero. And Okay. No, so we're, we're talking now about no tax increase at all. Actually, if this a very holds. slight decrease. Well, good. Tom. Except Tom. the caveat is, yeah, that's right, the town. I think the, the but the uh, school's going up four or five cents, I think. Eight cents, eight percent. The Isn't four it? cents, I think. Okay. But this is where, Brian, the, the uh, estimate you're going to provide is almost going to be meaningless because the new grand list will be issued this year. And that's, that's going to change. another point that we have. The, our grand list is going to go up again. It's not well defined right now. Uh, I don't believe, I, I have a little bit more digging to do, but I don't believe it's well defined on when we pay the village. And if we pay the village based on the current launched grant list, or if we're going to pay the village their 10% after reappraisal is completed. I move we pay them now. I, th I think in the past we've always done it by what we budgeted, but you're right. At the time when we would pay them, there's gonna be a different grant list. Right. In this year, because of reappraisal, the grand list as of July 1st will not be the lodged grand list right now. It will probably be something. It'll probably go up. Yeah. Uh, so we will probably do a little bit better for our taxes, but we will also probably, the, the argument can be made that the number we have budgeted in here for what we're gonna pay the village, uh, is for the next financial year. It's for uh, financial year starting July 1st. And starting July 1st, the 10% will be different. Actually, we always build our budget with a grand list that we know as of today. And every year that grand list does change to some degree. Yep. And we never make that adjustment. No, that's one of the reasons why we tend to end up with a little bit of a surplus. 
Well, in theory, if your ta if your grant list goes up, right. your tax rate should go down. True. And, so, but that doesn't mean your taxes necessarily go down. And thank you. typically what happens is homeowners assess value goes up and it's adjusted up even more because uh, traditionally mobile homes are over assessed and they're assessed down. Right. And you may find that there are other what that the, the village may not go up as much as others go up. I mean, I just don't have a clue on how how in the, what that is going to be, and they're not they're not you know. A reappraisal is going to be different than our year over year change. Uh, so it's we can ask Rosemary when she gets here, but I don't think we've ever made that adjustment after the fact from the budget. We certainly don't do it every year with the slight differences. Yeah. So as have. of right now, we're sitting pretty. Yep. It's definitely not the first time we've done a reappraisal. So yes. We have just been there should be a precedent. There. Sure, but we have precedent. Uh, this is good news. Uh, that's kind of what I mean. I've got a little, I've got more than I need to look in on this, but in the charter, uh, in, the, in the original document that talks about the 10% on the grand list, it's not defined a grand list as of this date. It's sure. the grand list. Ten percent of the grand list. Okay. So maybe it ends up being as agreed on by the select board and the or it's a litigation point. As Rosemary recalled, it was that the boards had come to an agreement on this before. Uh, but she believes that it was a discussion between the two boards rather than dictate from one board saying that we're going to pay you on this day. Back in that day, it was a negotiated 10 cents on the grand list. It was never the 10 cents. We negotiated what was going to be paid every year. So, <laughs> thank you. Do you want to take a seat and be some words so we can interrogate you? <laughs> <laughs> a couple of questions we have on the uh, 10 cents on the grand list that we pay the village. The grand list is going to change, but yet we're budgeting a number. What have we done in the past? Um, in the past, you, the two boards have come to an agreement. We have the first. Okay. What did you say? What you say? Come, the two boards have come to an agreement on reappraisal years. Okay. And yeah, they. It's a significant difference. Yeah. Will there? Well, you have no way of knowing yet. So, by coming to an agreement, you're, they're coming to an agreement on which year they use, or they, they pick a number? A number. It's never been the 10%. It is now. It has been the last number of years. Whatever 10 cents is, is what we have paid. Okay, uh, probably we ought to get into our regular agenda. Sure. Uh, hmm. well, the board prepared to approve the meeting minutes for January 7th and the 13th. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? And Rosemary, are you prepared? Mm. Still shuffling. Get all your paperwork mixed up here. Mm -hmm. 
half of the stuff needs signatures, the other half doesn't. Okay. You ready? Mm -hmm. You got it. Do you know when those are getting delivered? Yeah, I'm hoping soon. Will that be taken care of when we, will that, will the IT be going to be stored somewhere off site? Backup? No, that's just for like anything that's non NIMRIC wires. Oh, oh, okay. The NIMRIC stuff. Yeah. Yeah, the, the battery backup keeps us working in the office so that we can mm -hmm. shut down properly. Yeah. Second and well, the second item on that mm -hmm. wasn't. Did you get a check on that? We got a check for one of his properties, the one that sold, but not the other ones. Did you get the larger one? Yes. We got a check for about thirty-eight thousand dollars. Well, that's a good chunk of that sixty-three thousand. Check the total. Questions, Rosemary? Did you? 
Brown. Did you get the? Thank uh, you, Rosemary. Uh, Rosemary stuff. Yeah, I think so. Uh, no, I'm still. I didn't get a copy. Brian, did you have a report for the rope commissioner, rope form? Yeah, I get some of it. Uh, the brief summary. Uh, there was a question last time about the how much we had spent on the November first flood so far. It's about forty-one thousand um, dollars. But that also that still leaves uh, the work to do the armored low water crossing at right. uh, Rocky Road, which will be uh, an additional about eighty-five thousand dollars. Eighty-five thousand dollars to bring it back to what it was. Not to bring, uh, to bring it back to what it was would probably be closer to about forty thousand. Uh, to do the low water crossing, uh, where we would wash out the road less frequently, would be closer to eighty-five thousand. And the town match would be uh, fifteen percent of that, or ten percent, or something. Uh, but about fifteen percent. Fifteen percent. Okay. So we're we're into that right now for forty one thousand. That forty one thousand does is not none of the project cost. The, that's just uh, miscellaneous. That's all everything about that disaster. So that's okay. our work on other roads. It is our work on Rocky Road, uh, but it, it's none of our. I'm not sure that any of our current work that we've done so far on Rocky Road would be applicable to a. Uh, a match for the low water crossing if we were able to, to do that project. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did budget for doing that project next year. Thanks. And that's. Anybody got any questions for the question? Thanks. The highway. We doesn't look like any planning commission folks here. Um, was there any planning commission report? Uh, I didn't get anything. I know that the planning commission, uh, yeah, that they're working on uh, electing a new chair right now. So I think they okay. might be in a little bit of flux this week. Okay. Um, because the others are identified at time slots. Probably shouldn't go into them until we get to that time. Uh, I do want to mention uh, Seth contacted me that he's going to be a little bit late. Okay. Uh, are you Jessica? Were, were you copied on that email? Yes. Okay. Uh, I did grab the projector. Uh, Okay. So you want to start setting it up with that wall? Yeah. Yeah. Work. Thank you. And I'm I'm not sure if Mark's going to make it in or not. He he's had a family emergency happen, but he might he might still be here. Okay. So we might as well go into your agenda. The first item we've already. Dress. Yep. Uh, yeah, to accommodate Scott's schedule, we had, as everybody was aware, we, we can, did the review of Newport emergency, the NEMS budget. Um, and then, Ellis, uh, you're here about the VAST has some land use agreements that you need yeah, to I did agree two grants. One on French Hill and one on East Johnson Road. In order to get reimbursed, I need just a lay on the commission form so I play here. Okay. Do you have the, the forms? Yep. Which two areas? What's that? Which two areas? French Hill and uh, East Johnson Road. Okay. What's the board's pleasure? I got a question about East Johnson Road. Yeah. What's going on up there with the improvement? It sounds like uh, uh, Vasa did some yeah. work up there. What's the status of that? Um, we're going to wait till spring. 
rectify it. Okay, but that doesn't have any. No, no. this is really like a fiber up from where they did that. Okay. Yeah, it is. It's a dangerous spot, but we're going to fix it, and or they're going to fix it, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm so, kind of surprised because it was Dave Gilladale who worked for the state of Mar, retired from the state, and I can't believe he left it like that. But, so basically, it needed a bigger culprit. Yeah. And they only put a short piece in it and you put a hole about that deep. And I was like, really? <laughs> Did they have permission to work on our road? The, we had granted them some permission uh, to do maintenance work, uh, but we didn't grant them permission for leaving that a project in that kind of state. Like that was. Yeah. So they're, we're working with them to get that fixed. Yeah, that, that was well outside of the agreement we had with them. We're going to fix that one way or the other. It'll be done. So what did you do? So what, what is this? This is, uh, I don't know if you've been up there lately when, uh, I can't remember his name, that went in there log. He really destroyed it. He cut down through the side of the road so the banks were like eroding in. And it was really, we just moved everything out. So is this on easy. Sinclair Road? Uh, yeah. 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 But it was getting, uh, what was his name? Yeah, I know who he was. He went in there and destroyed it. Yeah. And nobody ever fixed it really. He was supposed to go back to it. He never did it. We basically went in there, for, we for no had a light for a and smoothed it all out. For no one? Uh, no. Do you know what the Bobby green here? She could have got Was it an Earl? Earl. 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 Yeah. Okay. So basically, you just need our signature because to so get, get the green. Yeah, it's yeah. just a standard procedure that we go through. And this, it's actually not a bad idea because it, it uh, makes sure you're. Yeah, municipalities are covered anyway, so it, it's a good thing to have it in the file down here in the Bay Glass Office. So we used to do it years ago. Somehow we just kind of got away from doing it. You've already done the work. Oh, yeah. 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 So I'm just going to approve this. I need this to get it first. first. Uh, got a motion to approve. Authorizing the chair to sign. Do we have a second? Second. Who made the motion? Doug. Yeah. Any more discussion? All in favor, sing five, sing aye. All right. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, Alice. Thank you. And I have one little issue with that. No, oh, you've got one big issue. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sounds um, like a cold. <coughs> Everybody's coming in here tonight's got colds. Yeah, well, unfortunately, yeah. So, um, I found out Friday <laughs> down on uh, the rail trail, where the uh, between McClure Farm and uh, uh, the road there, that mm -hmm. little road there. You know where your culvert comes out up here? I mean, there's a culvert down here under the rail bed. That they're going to go in and fix that in about a week. And I don't know if it's impossible we can run the road for a week. We sign it real slow. We call it and everything. So, whereabouts? To whereabouts? It's, you know. If you were coming from Parker's, you'd come to the road, then you cross the road, it's yep. that little stretch there. Where it goes out there. Okay, okay. Where would you get back onto the trail? You'd get back around at the end of the road. Okay. Where it goes to Parker's. Same thing down there for Parker's. But uh, I don't know why they're going to do it in the middle of winter, but yeah. Who's doing it? Yeah, who's uh, it? Uh, it's going out. It's supposed to be open tomorrow. Yeah. If I find out who it is, I'll call it. Is gas yeah. doing this? Or the no, this is the state. Okay. Yeah. They're fixing all these hell and storm things in the middle of the winter, which doesn't make any sense to me. So you're looking for the board's permission to use that stretch of. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure it's going to happen, but I'm just giving you a little bit. If it does happen. Yeah. What's the board's pleasure? Do you know when the construction, you said, it's supposed to start when? You're opening bids tomorrow? We're opening bids tomorrow and it's supposed to start next week. That's what I heard. Yeah, I don't know if it's true. 
It's great. We just, we're going to, I guess it's only going to take a week to do it. Because they got to go in and push, dig out all the snow. Dig out that powder. What's board's pleasure? Uh, motion to approve. Uh, For the minutes, do you want a more detailed description <laughs> of what exactly is the stretch of what road? Fast is? use, fast use of uh, yeah. River Road East between McClure's and McClure's and Dogs and Dogs and Manchester's. 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 So, right where the rail trail crosses. River Road East by our gravel pit. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then you would get back on the belt at Dog's Head. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So it'd be that one little section. And you put up some. Yeah. You'll yeah. Be able to see. Oh, yeah. It'll be something heavy. Put cars in the river. Like yeah. I said, I don't know if it's really going to happen, but. Mm -hmm. And you'll communicate with Brian there. as soon yeah. as you absolutely yeah. find out. Okay. Yeah, let, yeah. let's. So we so have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and second. Any more discussion? I, I assume that this is for the period, you know, if it does happen for the period of time that it's, uh, the rail trail is not uh, usable. I, I think that's a fa fair assumption. It was only for the duration that that yeah. section is not going to be available. Yeah. Okay. Any other discussion? Timeline what's gonna happen. Yeah, please. All those in favor, sing five, saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, the next two items, I, I believe, are going to be relatively quick. Um, we've got our highway mileage certificate. Um, no changes from last year uh, that I'm intending. So uh, I'm just looking for kind of the, the board's endorsement of this. The, the, I sign it. There's nothing that you need to do, but. Uh, we just have to approve it, right? Yeah. Motion to approve the certificate of highway mileage. Second. The motion is second. Any discussion? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying, saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Uh, next, we'll be posting the overweight vehicle notice. Uh, there is one small change. All the same roads are covered with all the same uh, weight limits, but we're starting on March 1st. Uh, last year, we had started... Um, we had started our coverage... Uh, in the second week of March, and this year we're starting the first week of March. Okay. And the reason being, we were a little bit behind the eight ball last year? I honestly don't recall why we started at the second week of March, but it. Okay. when I was writing the notice for this year, it just seemed like March 1st was a easy to remember date. So. What's the board's pleasure? So moved. As presented? As presented. Do we have a second? Second. A motion second. Any more discussion? I have a question on that. That's 30 days. Say again? 30, 30 day posting? Uh, that'll be, uh, it's a little bit longer than 30, 30 days. It's March 1st to April 30th. So it'll be 60 days. So it's typical, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Last year, we ran into a little bit of trouble uh, with the, if you recall, the winter kind of dragged on for a long time. So we were relatively soft at that April 30th date. Um, if that happens again this year, next year, it's probably going to be worth revisiting and thinking about possibly changing those dates. Uh, but Brian and I didn't we had a brief discussion about it and didn't have uh, strong feelings about changing it this year. 
and we didn't want to react to a one-time blip of this and say that you can't haul on it until you know move out another month um you know say may something um but if that looks like it might be the new normal we'll have to reconsider that mm -hmm. any other discussion seeing none all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. those opposed mm -hmm. Always have it. Uh, if anybody's interested, on February 5th, uh, we're going to be attending a training on uh, weight restrictions uh, to try and improve our enforcement. Uh, 8 a.m. in Fairfax. But I don't know that anybody's <laughs> particularly <laughs> interested, but uh, I ha have found the trainings that I've attended on. Uh, weight limits on roads to actually be really informative and interesting. So uh, we can rely on. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, are we on time? Pretty good. All right. Uh, next item up, uh, we've got a cemetery deed for Carmen Sargent, and that's in. Yeah. Oh. This is the, the wife of the couple that came in. Uh, not the wife, uh, sister. Sister? Yep. Okay. And we might have some other family members over time, but right now, uh, Carmen is, is interested in, in closing on this. And how many plots did we believe were there? Uh, I don't recall off the top of my head how many Duncan had scoped out, but these are some that Duncan has already reviewed. Okay. So everything's ready to go on this. Um, you need a motion? Yes. Motion to approve the sale. You need a signature on it? Uh, actually, I need to print up one that doesn't say draft on it. But One second. Uh, if you can stop in uh, during the week or at our meeting on this coming Monday uh, for the signature, but I, I would appreciate your approval for this so I can mm -hmm. call Start Carmine and, and tell her that we're. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. A motion second. Any more discussion? Who signs? Uh, the whole board does. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor seeing five saying aye. 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 Those opposed? I'm going to abstain. And one abstention. You uh, don't think it's a cemetery anyway. That's why you abstain. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sheriff's Patrol budget proposal. Okay. Has that changed? Or? Nope. This is a little bit like the NEMS budget. We talked about digging into this with a little bit more detail. It is uh, it's a 3% increase, which is not a terrible increase, but it's, it's still a lot of money. Uh, and this has an interesting... Uh, I wouldn't say a condition, but a, a, an interesting uh, bit of information to go along with it. That Roger is interested in uh, pursuing a uh, kind of a multi-year agreement with us, uh, during which time we would conduct uh, more detailed studies about uh, law enforcement options. Uh, so he's thinking about holding at a 3% increase for a few years uh, while we do that study. Dara West would be excellent on that committee. She said. <laughs> Your track is just class four road thing for Gallagher. <laughs> <laughs> well, we you haven't done that, that yet? <laughs> we'll take care of that. Um, the, the budget's on the last uh, page of the packet. I just wanted to yep. point out. Um, he originally came to us with 10%, and the town's pretty much said we, we can't bring this to our voters. Um, so he worked on it some, but sort of the, the way he brought it down to that was, you'll see on the bottom, contribution from the County Sheriff's Department of 22000 So he's basically pitching in from other monies that he has um, and reducing his personal salary to um, keep this at 3% this year. What this means is that there are 
costs here that are that the taxpayers are being protected from for a, a period of time, and uh, that we can't be protected from that forever. We're we're going to have to do something. Either yeah. either suck it up and, and start paying the full the full boat, or look at some sort of way to reduce costs, reduction in service, something. So that's how that three percent got there. No, that doesn't seem very sustainable. <laughs> I, it, it's not, and Roger's pretty upfront that uh, what he kind of the agreement he wants us to. Again, it's not exactly an agreement, but what he wants from us over the next few years is kind of a commitment that we're okay with 3% increases for the next few years. And during that time, we're going to work on a kind of sustainability planning for law enforcement. And what does that mean for us? Uh, whether, excuse me, whether that's other options or not. Um, Well, we're going to figure it out. Be working hand in hand with Volca and Pike Park. If we decide to stay with the three-town contract, I think that whatever we do, we would want to work hand in hand with some of our neighbors. That I don't, I don't realistically see us going it alone, saving money. Uh, no. No. You know, I I, I suppose. Going to state police is an option, but we would see a pretty serious reduction in services if we went to state police. What is our what has been our increase, you know, in the past? Is is you know, if we're looking at three percent, then we're usually two to three percent? No, we're usually up north of that, like four or five percent. I mean it's it's almost back to back to back here. It's been pretty serious increases yeah. the last several years. Uh, while Rogers been trying to get a handle on uh, some equipment planning and uh, right. uh, staffing, but it's we've experienced <clears throat> pretty significant increases for the last several years. So he's been three percent is good for our increases. Yeah. So if we were going to negotiate for that, it'd be something we'd be happy to, normally to negotiate for. But recognizing that we can't bind, you know, the next year's support right. board and stuff like that, but it could be a Intention. Mm -hmm. Again, it's health care benefits that are, you know, killing his budget. Against yeah. The school board and us. I mean, this is just. A, I mean, his biggest. Well, he has the vehicles, but the biggest <clears throat> overhead is. is well, yeah. And uh, yeah, those costs come health care. I mean, health care went up sixty-nine, almost you know, almost sixty-nine and a half percent. Yeah. In one year. And. The biggest driver there is they went from most of his new hires have gone from single to family plans. So, so yeah, it, it's the plan choice. It's rising costs. Uh, yeah, it, it was healthcare is extremely expensive for him as as well. And their staff are paying approximately twenty five percent. Is that what we up there? Uh, his, his plan is quite a bit different than ours. He yeah. pays his contribution is seventy five percent of their premium and then a, uh, a contribution to their deductible also. To their HSA. Yeah. And we do just premiums and nothing else. Uh, with the caveat that if they keep their health, if they choose a plan that costs less than our standard premium, that gets contributed to an HSA. but. For our typical expenses are defined based on the premium and capped there. Um, you know, that's something that we might consider for <coughs> ourselves in the future. Uh, it's a little more variable than what we're currently doing, but it it being variable, sometimes it'll save money. You're talking about some portion self-insured? No, uh, it would be... Uh, like the, the way Roger's doing it was, is he pays less of their, their right. premium. Right, I, I so understand less of their that, monthly we, we could have our own fund in there and actually pay less for health care and then have like a self-insurance fund 
which would offset some of their deductibles, and it might end up saving the town money. It would be like that, but I don't think we would have to uh, actually set up a self-insurance fund. There's a lot of regulation that goes along with uh, having self-insurance that I don't... It would be passed on to the employee as an HSA. Yeah. I, I think we would use a, a health savings account as a, our method for this rather than self-insurance. Yeah, okay. But that's something we need to look into, too, if we still have continuing escalation of health care costs. When's he looking for the statement of intention? Or I think he said, like, three years he would commit to. He'd like to commit for three years. Um, and it's really, I would say, he didn't give us a deadline on, on this, but I think that we would want to start working on setting up that committee uh, within the next few months. Like I'd say, uh, uh, town meeting is probably a good opportunity for us to stump for uh, volunteers who want to study law enforcement alternatives. Um, you know, we'd appreciate some volunteers. I think we'd find a few too. Yeah. Uh, it's people know it's a big part of our budget that uh, uh, health and safety covers, I mean, we've got the budget right here, but it. I, it's nearly a third of our expense. Yeah. I, I um, would like to recruit members who are have a fairly neutral view on it and who aren't coming into it with an axe to grind. Um, that's my preference for that. Yes. I get a lot of eager volunteers who are looking to go one way or the other. No, I agreed. We, we would... So the thoughts to share some of this at town meeting? Mm -hmm. You prepared to talk to it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> I heard it. Uh, actually, it's right at the hour. If you wanted to start and if Seth's coming. Jessica? Oh no, we got uh, we'll, we'll jump back and forth to. Um, well, this merger update is that going to be a long one? Uh, merger update's not going to be too long. I've okay. got uh, a schedule of uh, individuals. Uh, Kyle, if I can put you on the spot, you're the only person uh, on the board that I don't have scheduled. Okay. Yes. Uh, so this is Thursday and Friday, uh, kind of late afternoon is what I've got left, or 7 in the morning on Friday. Um, um, okay. Uh, I opted out because I thought we were well represented. So. Yeah. Oh, um, <clears throat> late afternoons are the worst for me because I've got kids. Um, we can do this on, on, not at the meeting and, and you okay. can change times with whatever you've got me down for. If it's more convenient for Kyle, I can come in a second. Okay. I mean, does that make it easier? Uh, uh, Someone. So, huh? uh, I would, right now I've got Mike scheduled at one o'clock on Friday, and Kyle, if that works well for you, we, I can switch Mike. Unfortunately, that doesn't help me. Um... Well, how much more do I have to do? <laughs> <laughs> um, when did you have me scheduled? Uh, Eric, I've got you at 11 a.m. on Friday. Does that work? That I'll take. I don't want seven. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take seven and put Eric in my spot. Okay. Okay, so that's the 24th? How that's the 24th. How long are the... Uh, in uh, they're scheduled for 45 minutes uh, with a couple minute break, uh, a buffer in between. Send me an email the night before so I don't forget it. Please. Uh, Mike, you're there. Eric, you're 1 o'clock. Okay. 24th, 1 o'clock, right? Yeah. I'm 24th at 07. Yes. Are we supposed to prepare questions? Like, what's, what's the... Uh, if you have 
any particular insight. Um, it is broadly a review of our capacity and possible savings. You know, what would we, if we merge the town and the village, what would be the effect? Would we be able to sustain it or not? Um, that's not necessarily going to be where uh, your or members of the public, uh, Gene and Jess, I think I've sent both of you emails offering for times as well. Um, and any other members of the public are welcome to come in and speak to the uh, consultant as well. Um, and for those individuals, uh, it's going to be more about kind of political will and insight into the community. Uh, that it's, you know, what what's the public perception behind merger, and what what does the public perceive as possible benefits? Uh, you know, and that'll kind of get at the the willpower to merge or not merge. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what the public perceives is not necessarily what is advantageous to both parties. No, and so that's where interviews with myself, Rosemary, Meredith, Brian Krause, Troy, uh, that's where we're, we're gonna come in, it is that we're providing the money, the money and the data and you know, is the, the work capacity there? Is the cost savings there? Uh, what is it gonna functionally mean to merge the town and the village? Uh, but then it's, it's also what do community leaders think about merger, and that, that's, that's where you come in. Uh, so it's a, you're providing a different piece to this. If you have a particular uh, topic or something that you think might be overlooked, uh, you can certainly bring that up. Uh, I think any un unique insight that a person has would be valuable uh, because it might be missed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but no, there's not any particular preparation or anything that you need to do. Eric or Brian, is there a public meeting scheduled for next Monday on this? There is. Uh, Monday the 27th at 6 p.m. here. Uh, we're going to have a, a public meeting about the, the merger. So if you feel that you want to know more about it, you don't have any, you know, you don't need a one on one conversation with a consultant or anything, but you want to have an opportunity to have your voice heard. Or listen, also, um, that would be the opportunity on, on the 27th. Is Walter Pomeroy going to? Walter Pomeroy has a slot. Good. So that's merger open uh, public meeting. Yep. Tomorrow at, I mean, Monday, Monday at 6. Okay. <clears throat> And we're meeting at seven. Yep. That's a plan. There's a lot of people shows up. We're gonna to have to go to a different location. Uh, we will almost certainly have our meeting uh, downstairs and allow up here for extended discussion on the merger. Uh, I'm gonna work with Kent a little bit before I draft our agenda for that meeting and we'll see if uh, I'll, I'll communicate with Eric about scheduling the time if we want to tweak the our start. Time. Yeah. Are you planning to do front porch forum posts and yep. really get the word out? Okay. Okay. Uh, good. Okay, that's the merger update. Any update on the, actually the that next one's a good one if Seth shows up. Yeah, we um, can pick his brain a little bit. Um, you know, Seth and I were able to, I, I guess I can fill you in. That Seth and I were able to uh, get together and talk uh, about the light industrial park, um, kind of make sure that getting ourselves up on the same page, getting up to speed and uh, beginning the application for the, the long form application for the same grant we've been pursuing, but under the, uh, you know, this is the EDA grant under the uh, 
Ice Jam. Second category, second disaster category for the Ice Jam, uh, which is, it needs a new application um, and uses a different form. But uh, I've got a decent amount of work already done on that that I'm handing over to Seth, and he's going to take it and run. Any feelings on how competitive we are? I think we're very competitive on this. That's good to know. Cost uh, to do beautification. You want to do your beautification update? Uh, yep, I could. So um, the beautification committee met last week and had a, let's say, a productive conversation. We revisited. Um, the projects that we sponsored this past year um, and talked about what um, our priorities are for this year. Um, we came to a, a consensus that we're interested in um, sort of building upon some of the things that we've already done, like continuing with landscaping efforts on the Village Green um, here at this building. but felt strongly that we wanted to put, um, s spend a little bit more, more money in getting um, the results that we want versus putting less money into, to, you know, into um, someone that's not able to, to uh, do, this, you know, uh, a job that we're satisfied with. So we were, were very happy with Andrea and what she did, Andrea Blaisdell, and what she did at the Village Green and interested in hiring her potentially to do the landscape design for this building um, and continue with phase two of the uh, Village Green. But we wanted to poll both the village trustees and the select board on what they felt like, um, how they felt about that and, and just priority projects in general for for the um, for this line item um, yeah um, the one thing I would add is, is that the uh, in this fiscal year we the proposal was that we would put if we have money we put it into the Arboretum yes so we need to get clear on it exactly if if this number in the budget is completely accurate that everyone has been paid from last year's project so Jen Burton for the mural and um, Andrea for the landscaping Andrea's been all paid. I'm she not has sure about Jen okay okay um, I actually That's contacted her it, it's, it's the work is yeah. completed. We have to hang it. Okay. Yeah. So Jen's part of it is done. That's what's going on in Parker's work. Yes. Yeah, a mural. But I um, thought we were just paying for supplies for that. We yes. are. We are. And we shot a little bit high for what she might need, so she, she may not have spent everything that we allocated. I think we said $800, and she thought that was more than enough, but... Um, I'm not sure what the actual ended up being. Well, most of us got that from Country Home Center, so. Okay. Yeah, as far as I know, those, all of those were paid. Okay, okay. So if indeed we still have, what was it, a little over $1,000 yeah. left, um, the board felt good about uh, um, giving that leftover money to, to the tree board's efforts with the Arboretum. So you don't think you're going to start anything more in the spring for beautification? No. Assuming that Jen's paid out. No. Yes, when are we going to have Andrea start or anybody doing watering and plantings? Uh, if we're going to have, if we want to have somebody start, we shouldn't count on giving the entire balance to the Arboretum. Because of the July 1 start date. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, That's a good point. Then you can just start in May. Right, right, right. Um, Gordy was going to be in touch with Andrea about um, 
her phase two plan um, for at least for the village green. So um, right now the plantings are kind of in the back and we were um, envisioning or she was envisioning that they would uh, come out to the sides a bit too to sort of really cozy the space in. So um, we kind of we need to get more information from her basically about what that would look like. So we could come back and when we have a breakdown and yeah. Basically get permission to spend yeah. for. But we felt like her work was far superior than what we've been, the results that we've been getting from Peter mm -hmm. Moynihan, and um, feel like if she's open for doing more landscaping work, that she's the one that we would want to hire moving forward. My sense is um, to. I don't want to second guess the beautification committee. Whatever you guys want to do, I'm supportive of. My priorities as an individual are still the signs on either end of the village and uh, in mm -hmm. this building mm -hmm. would be my top priorities. And mm -hmm. The Arboretum is kind of not in a place that a lot of people see it. So uh, getting spending money in those high impact places I think would, would be the best, but that's just Take it for what it's worth. Okay. Yeah. I, I think the discussion was that we were going to get the, at least the designs for this building sure. uh, for a more comprehensive mm -hmm. uh, improvement here. Uh, uh, that maintenance, you know, we'd keep up doing maintenance, but we also want to look at, again, the, 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 Bigger redesign and yeah. improvement. Okay. And we'll take an action of the board to transfer that money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you probably wouldn't want to make that recommendation until you know what springtime money you might need. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? That's it. We're going to write a report for the. Um, County for board? the. Yep. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. In the works. Do you think uh, Seth's going to make it? He is still stubborn 45. Yeah. Really than um, I've got one more uh, little update I can do from old business uh, about the uh, racial bias training uh, that we're oh, yeah. working on. Um, I've been playing phone tag with the school, uh, but the gym is not open on February 1st when we had hoped. Oh, really? No. Uh, the, it, it's, it is also reserved for basketball. Uh, so hmm. what are their availability dates? That's what I'm working on right now is I'm going to go to them and pick a date that's available, and then I'll come back to the board and say, we can hold it at the gym on this day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's either that or we limit the number of participants, which I don't think is what the board wants to do. In my experience, Brian, you have to physically go into the school and talk to either Janet Davis or it, Mr. Manning. Kelly is the person that uh, David okay. has turned me on to who does scheduling for the gym. Okay. Yeah, she works behind the yeah. counter there as well. So it'll be another update on that. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure that we were all aware of okay. where we were in the process. The next item is uh, the sheriff's report. That's just the one that got emailed to us, correct? Yep. So that's no update. Uh, if and then we, the, we've got a couple executive session items and uh, actions but, following the executive session items. So. But item 12, uh, yeah. this is something that came out of, as you guys all know, Rosemary was conducting the interviews for assistant, and Gordy and I were assisting Rosemary in those interviews. Uh, the thought we had is we should probably think about performing background checks for anyone we hire in the down in stairs in the office because of the amount of money that flows through there. But 
that would, does require an approval of both the select board and the trustees. Uh, the one comment I have on this is that we have been conducting background checks of all new employees, but it's not part of our policy. Uh, okay. It's been part of our practice. If you recall, when we've made motions to offer somebody em employment, we've made it part of the motion to offer as a condition of pass passing a background check. It would be better if it was part of our personnel policy. Uh, Even for like the public works? Yep. Okay, I didn't, every, I didn't remember every that. Every uh, We've, like I said, we've done it, but it hasn't been part of our okay. policy and we're, we'd be better off if it was, it was part of our policy. So just looking for a motion to amend personnel policy for a background check. I've right. got a copy That's of the alone. village's motion if we want to make a similar one. Probably we should. All right. It shall be the policy of the town of Johnson to conduct pre-employment background checks as a condition of all offer of employment unless specifically waived by the select board. That's your motion? That's my motion. I'll second that. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? We have some handouts so that it's going to pass around. You know, this isn't huge over here. I don't know why. It's going to be okay. You want us to turn off the See, there's some things um, are on the handouts, the things that are the most hard to read on the screen, but there are some things that are not included in the handout. Um, so, with the Loyal County Planning Commission, um, we um, have been working on this flood study of the Loyal River. So, I'm Jessica Luisos. Um, and this is Doug Osborne. So we're both water resource engineers um, at a company called Myelonoma Room. We've been working with Seth on kind of evaluating flooding um, through Johnson, through Johnson along the Lamoille River. So um, kind of the focus of this study is to look at um, parcels where redevelopment might um, be occurring. And then on those parcels, um, what would be the results hydraulically of filling? Um, you know, we know that there's some contaminated soils on some of those properties, and redevelopment efforts may um, include kind of raising buildings or raising land to redevelop it. So, so on redevelopment parcels, looking at filling, and then how that affects flooding and the water. Um, and then also looking at some other parcels where maybe um, those could remain wild, be lowered down to allow more flood storage. So it's kind of a two-part study, and we'll get into exactly what those look like. So um, this, this is one of your handouts. This is the big map, so you don't need to see that here necessarily, but I can describe what's on here. So many of you are probably familiar with the redevelopment studies that have been done. So we we focused on um, the areas on your map, which are pink, are the areas that uh, were included as redevelopment, and we looked at, at filling the land, so just like raising the land up on those parcels. So um, kind of all of our numbering and lettering starts upstream and moves downstream. Um, so in this case, that is um, from the bottom uh, right kind of the top left along the Little Mile River. So looking at uh, Manchester Mill and Park Ranch Stearns, kind of this one big area, uh, the former talc mill, kind of the two pieces of that. And then for areas that could be kind of remain wild and be flooded areas are the yellow areas. So kind of this piece up here, which is actually part of Manchester Mill property on the corner of the big bend in the river. Um, this area, which has a portion of it is a skate park um, and a big kind of 
cultural area down there. So, what are the, the thing we started with first, and I probably should have mentioned this actually while you're looking at the map. Um, so, we started with the FEMA hydraulic model um, that was used, it was created decades ago, kind of with much older information, and that's what kind of the FEMA floodplain is based on. And um, knowing that that information is, is not very recent, we did um, quite a bit of additional survey to resurvey areas and add additional survey cross sections to that model to make it a lot more accurate. So there was some survey done in 2016, and then we did more as part of this project. So you can see it where these lines are on the map, um, and they're color coded. So the yellow and red lines represent spots that had new survey as part of this project. Um, there are, you know, because of budget constraints, there were some the green lines kind of retains the original FEMA data. Um, so an example of what that looks like, so this is only up here, it's not in the handout, but this black line is the new cross-section information, and the pink line is the original FEMA. So you can see the FEMA one was much more kind of blocky and chunky. Um, so there was survey done in the crop in the in the channel and immediately adjacent to the channel, kind of through the mill properties or across the floodplain reconnection areas. And then kind of beyond that, you can see there's all these many, many dots here. Then we use the LIDAR to kind of expand that area. And you know, you can see there's a little bit of uh, similarity or quite a bit of similarity, but but some differences. So we actually saw that just by doing this update, the, the floodplain and the flood elevations did change um, some kind of throughout the updated model area. In some places, um, our updated model matches the FEMA, and in some places, it's actually pretty different. So up to a 1.3 feet uh, different in, for the 100-year flood. Um, and as part of this, we did updated um, floodplain modeling and mapping. So this is up here, this isn't in your handout. You can see this blue shaded area with kind of the dark blue outline. That is the updated 100 year floodplain extent um, that was created with our updated model. And this also uses the new LIDAR information, uh, which is quite accurate to actually Kind of find exactly where the outside limits of the flooding would be. So, so the blue area represents the area that would be flooded um, during the 100 year flood kind of under today's conditions based on our new survey. Um, there are a few things to point out here. Um, looking at the areas, our study areas, the yellow areas. Um, so this floodplain reconnection area A, it's, it's high and dry right now. Floodwaters don't really get into that area. Some of the other floodplain reconnection areas, this area B on the bend in the river does have some flooding during the 100-year flood, um, as well as the skate park area and part of uh, floodplain connection area D. Um, so if we lower them down, more water would get on some, um, and more, you know, this area would flood, you know, kind of in our explored conditions. So then we have the, the mill properties. Um, not very much of the Parker and Stearns and Manchester mill property floods, um, according to the model under existing conditions, kind of a portion of the Tauk mill two pieces do. So I know that maps are a little hard to um, kind of picture exactly where we're talking about. So we have some photos up here just to kind of prompt your memory as to exactly what you're looking at on the map. So you have your map in front of you. Um, floodplain restoration area A, so the bottom kind of yellow area on the map, looks like this if you're driving along the road. There's some tractor trailers there, some kind of storage boxes. Um, so moving down the river, make sure I'm going in order. 
So then um, Manchester Mill area is part of the redevelopment area one, as well as kind of the Parker and Stearns. Coming further down the river to the Sharp Bend, um, where the river is really close to Route 15. So this is across the river from Route 15. We have a big field there, so that's floodplain restoration area B. <coughs> So area C, so just outside of the picture is the skate park area. This is a portion of it. Um, so then coming down into redevelopment area two, so the former talc mill, this is the area really close to the river. Um, in that kind of the first piece there. Um, so reconnection area two. And then redevelopment area three, um, has quite a bit of storage and piles of stumps and um, materials out there today. And then floodplain restoration area D. So this is really close to Route 15 where it crosses um, the river. So um, models are really only as good as the information that you put into them. So we did do some validation to look to see how accurate we felt our model was. So you earlier were talking about the November 1st flood. Um, that was one of the things we used to kind of check where we felt, where we saw the flooding in the model and where we saw flooding um, in November. Um, so you know, based on where we saw flooding in photos and observing, and then looking at our mapping and flood elevations in the model to see how well they matched. Um, the model uh, here in Johnson, you also have a USGS river gauge. So that gauge measures the water surface elevation of the water over time. Um, so our model um, actually was within two tenths of a foot at the gauge location. It's a little upstream of the project area, but it's kind of an indication that things were uh, matching up pretty well. And then based on our observances, you know, we were within a half a foot to a foot um, of kind of the observed value. So um, this gives an idea as to kind of exactly how accurate things could be. So you know, if you're you're seeing model results of a foot um, for accuracy of about a foot. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, when you're actually getting into the actual results of the model, everything's really relative. So, you know, if you see um, you know, the difference between the existing and the proposed results are, are all relative. So let's see. So we said uh, this this is in your um your data, so it's in the back of the map. And we thought that before we get into numbers, it would be nice to kind of go through exactly what the alternatives are. So um, number one was just existing conditions. So all the results that you'll see start by looking at existing conditions. And then we explored two different kind of redevelopment filling scenarios. So on all of the yellow properties, the, the mill properties, um, looking at filling one foot and two feet over the floodplain area, well, the whole area of the property expected to flood. Um, so we did the range because those are pretty common amount of soil that you would put over contaminated soil to cap it. So um, you know this information would be able to be used to inform the, the soil remediation studies by looking back and saying, okay, well they explored what happens if we put a foot of cap over the contaminants well on two feet, and we know whether or not that works from the river perspective. We looked at those alternatives, um, then got into looking at the flood storage areas. So in the areas identified as potential new floodplain areas, um, how much we could dig down and, and what kind of results or uh, benefits we might get from that. So um, four was cutting those areas down to 10-year flood elevation, and then number five was cutting it down even further so that a five-year flood would start to get up and onto those floodplains. And then there's a series of alternatives where we looked at a couple different combinations of things. Um, I think seven is one to really point out for you because I think it has a lot of bearing on 
um, how redevelopment might happen. So the idea of seven is that on the redevelopment areas, is there a way to balance the cut and fill on the specific property? So that an area right next to the river could be cut down and kind of used for flood storage while the rest of the site could be filled. Um, you know, and would that work hydraulically within the site so you don't need to rely on kind of an off-site Let's go right here. And I think as we see the results, you know, we, we could you know, talk a little bit more about what all these mean. So I'm just going to talk through some of the alternatives and results. So here we're looking at one of the um, cross sections in the model that goes through the Manchester Mill. Parcel. And so this is an area that we looked at filling one foot initially and then two feet in a potential capping scenario. So here you can see that the purple is the existing ground and then the black is raising that whole um, area of the Manchester Mill as parcel by two feet and to see how that would affect the, the hydraulics through the area. Um, at this location specifically, you can see we're, we're up here in one of these cross sections. Um, the 100 year flood under existing conditions actually isn't getting onto the parcel. So adding that fill wouldn't make a difference um, in this scenario, which is good to know. But you do see that the 500 year um, water surface elevation is right about getting onto the parcel. So that, that fill might have an impact on the, the 500 year flood elevation. And then the the floodplain excavation that we looked at looked like this. Um, we're looking at floodplain restoration area A, which is the, the upstream most location on your map. Um, and in this case, the purple is the existing ground again, and then the black is cutting down to the five-year flood level in this case. So you know you would cut up to nine feet at a maximum there, down so that the five-year flood would be able to get onto the site and, and start inundating the site, have flood storage, um, deposit material, and in an ice jam event, it would be more readily available for ice to shed and get onto the floodplain rather than being carried um, downstream toward the bridges. So here is a big table of results from our analysis. Um, how this works is a lot of numbers here. But we have the cross sections of the model going from the most upstream and then all the way to the downstream of the project area. In the next column, we have key locations of those that those cross sections correspond to. So this cross section goes through floodplain restoration area A, and then there's a cross section before you then get into the first redevelopment area and then continue through a bridge, another redevelopment area, just for, for reference for those. And again, you can look back to your map to see where exactly those cross sections are. So here we're looking at the water surface elevation for the 100 year flood. And the first column it, of results is the existing water surface elevation. And then each column here is the change in water surface elevation at that location for that alternative. And we color coded it so that if it's white, then it means there's zero change from existing. If it's red, it means there's an increase in the water surface elevation from existing. And then if it's green, there's a decrease from the existing water surface elevation. And you'll see that a lot of these are still 0, 0.0. And that's because the change in water surface elevation is less than 0.05 or negative 0.05. Um, and based on the precision of the model, we only show to the tenth of the foot, but just if you, if you do see that it's green or red and it says 0.0, .0 there is a small change at that location. Um, and so just again to, to mention the first, the second and third alternatives of looking at the fill, just the fill scenarios, which is why you see um, red numbers across the board, you are seeing slight increases to the water surface elevation because you're filling those redevelopment areas and you're not offsetting them in this case. 
So generally, the, the, the rise is, is really low. There's just a couple areas where it even gets to a tenth of a foot and makes it um, you know, go above that 0 0.05 threshold. Um, but there is a general rise across the target area. So then alternatives four and five again, we're looking at just cutting those floodplain restoration areas first to the 10 year and then to the five year. And again, in this case, you see there's green numbers across the board. We're seeing general decreases to the flood elevations for the whole project area. For the 10 year um, floodplain cut, you're seeing one, you know, a ten, two tenths in some places, maximum about four tenths of a foot there near the end of the project area. And then only, only a slight increase really when you, when you um, cut down to the five year instead, it isn't making that much more of an impact than the initial cut down to the 10 year with water surface elevation. And then as we continue on, as Jessica noted, alternative seven was where we were just looking at balancing the cut and fill on the redevelopment sites. And that showed us that you know, we, we could balance that filling on the sites with some sort of cutting a floodplain closer to the river, what we call a flood bench. Um, and we'll show you what that would look like on the plan view of the map. But that shows that we, we could accomplish not changing the water surface elevations with that redevelopment without having to go to another parcel to establish new floodplain, which is really good to know. Um, and then as we get to the end, what we call our third alternative was alternative nine. And that was kind of um, the, the extreme scenario of filling two feet on all of the redevelopment areas. So they were all redeveloped and capped with the two feet, which is the higher amount. And then cutting all of the floodplain areas down to the 10 year water surface elevation. Um, so that shows that, that balance and that we can, we can really get you know, a few tenths of a foot of um, uh, flood elevation decrease with those with those floodplain cuts while still redeveloping all of those areas at the same time. So then next we looked at the velocities through the project area, which generally um, saying similar similar uh, things to the to the water surface changes. Um, again, in this case, we color coded them. So if you see green, that means in this case, a decrease to the velocity. And if you see red, that means a slight increase to the velocities. Um, one thing I want to point out is that for alternatives four and five, when we're cutting down the floodplain and doing no filling, um, you, you don't see general velocity decreases across the project area, but local to those floodplain restoration areas, you know, floodplain restoration area A, you are seeing a drop in, um, in velocities. So, so that would mean that the water's slowing down at those locations, it's getting out onto the floodplain. If there's, again, if there's ice jamming occurring, that, that ice would be getting out on the floodplain, depositing rather than continuing downstream um, in those locations. Anything else there? These changes in velocity are really small. I know this looks really red, um, which would be bad, faster moving, but um, in kind of in the grand scheme of velocity, it's, it's a very, very small amount. So I, I think I wouldn't be alarmed by this. And, um, you know, with a permitting effort, there is a much bigger focus on the water surface elevation, which was the, the previous um, table we were looking at. But, you know, this is important just to know that it's, it does change how things move. Um, and in some cases, the water might be going slightly faster. So if you're saying faster water is, in theory, worse? It can be worse, um, and you know I think like a regulator might want to know if the water is going faster because it could create more erosion, or you know if it's going faster through a bridge, there might be more scour. So I think just having this information available so you can like 
answer those questions um, is just important to have, and you know, it is something you have now. Is that Sorry. I know for a fact faster the water means the less ice you're gonna build. Right. And ice is a problem we've got up here. Yeah. So so in your case, you know, it actually might not be a bad thing. And especially like Doug was saying, if the water slows down when it gets to the spots where it's appropriate for logs and ice to kind of get out of the river, um, you know, this might be like a good floods mitigation. Scenario. And so, just for basic principle here, your chart, the models here are to create more cubic space for water. The floodplain yeah. restoration areas will be doing that. So, has there been any talk of dredging? There has not. So, what we found is that um, we've modeled dredging all over the place, and it it doesn't work well um, for a few reasons. Um, one big reason is that the, the river, the way that rivers work is it fills it back in, so it doesn't last very long. Um, and what happens when you dig the, the river down, um, you know, if you have a channel and now you make it deeper, um, more water is stuck inside the river and it goes faster and, um, you know, as that happens, it creates more erosion on the sides um, and can actually like move around quite a bit more and kind of destabilize it. So, we've seen around the state dredging cause a lot more problems than, than it's worth. So, by bringing the water up and out in appropriate locations, it not only gives it more room, but it also slows it down to a point where you've got these other benefits too. Like there's a spot for the ice to go, there's a spot for the logs to go, instead of just um, kind of creating more of a hose, you know, it's- I hear what you're saying, yeah, I'm not sure I agree with it. I, mean, yeah. I hear what you're saying, I think there's a benefit to actually have that channel of moving water that can prevent ice from building up in the first place and have more space for the water instead of trying to slow it up, build ice, build log jams, build stuff that spills out and causes more problems. And just talking from the experience that I've seen that uh, sometimes having the water slow up and stop is, causes more problems. So I think unfortunately, um, you're kind of stuck with the slope of the river that you have. You know, Philomoyle is a relatively low slope river. So even if you dredge here, you know, it'd be hard to dredge all the way to the lake and get, you know, get I don't kind think of the, the lake chain plane people know that. <laughs> <in our sediment. laughs> There's also a lot of stuff between here and there that holds the water up. So I, yeah. So I, um, I lived on Railroad Street for over 30 years. I was in the 95 flood. And one of the things that I know is that, uh, the Gion was riprapped by the sewer plant here to protect it. But one of the visual changes that I've noticed is that there's more stream bank erosion on the Railroad Street side of the Gion River downstream from where that riprap has been placed. The river is bouncing off those rocks. Now it's coming into areas of well, I guess you'd call it a uh, floodplain, but it's, it's, it has eroded anywhere from, I would say, 60 to 100 feet into properties that are on that railroad street side. In one year, I saw about 40 feet of uh, property just fall into the river and sedimentation in the Guion, where it approaches the Lamoille. And if you look at the Lamoille, I want to know what you're saying about that stream. Uh, all of that gravel, all that sand fill as a result of rip rafting and bouncing the river off of those properties um, now has increased the sedimentation. So basically what's happening is the bottom of the river the river bed is getting closer to the surface of the river. And that culminated in the situation where we had the freeze <clears throat> and the thaw and the freeze, and basically that ice flow froze to the bottom of the river. And 
I don't know if there's a way to say it was avoidable, but it was a direct result of rip wrapping the stream bank over here to protect the sewer plant at the cost of uh, the property owners losing their property in the river. And it's literally created a hurdle for the Gion to try to get in, which then increases the flood proneness of the village, the, the uh, supermarket, and Railroad Street, the library, uh, any of the properties that are on that side of the street. I'm on the other side of the street, and so it's a, no, 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 it's, it gets close sometimes. So I think the fact that it gets close is a good um, reason why, you know, even if some of these floodplain storage areas might not be providing a huge number in, in here, um, you know, it, it makes these floodplain storage areas work. Um, you know, in a large flood, these areas are also an area where some of that sediment can kind of get out and spread out and instead of just depositing in the stream channel itself. So there's actually some natural dredging that winds up happening during floods if there's a spot for that sediment to go. Um, you know, so if you're, you know, if you kind of think about the map, there's the, um, there's the kind of floodplain area, I think it's B. It's um, kind of on the river bend. I think it's B. Yeah. Yeah, so if it's on the river bend there. I mean, that would kind of alleviate some of the pressure in the confluence area. One of the most important spots for these re floodplain reconnection areas is in the confluence area because as the water comes down the Gion and in, I know it's not perfectly lined up, but kind of just creates a little less pressure kind of through this whole area. You know, river bends are notoriously slow and a lot of energy get kind of goes into getting the river around those bends. So by creating more space at the, the sharp bend, um, you know, it will start to kind of alleviate some of the pressure through this area. I know this is a spot where Route 15 has had some trouble as well. So kind of creating more space for the river, um, you know, just means there's less direct pressure on Route 15 and, and less kind of buildup of material and ice and sediment kind of through the confluence area as well. So and that didn't exactly answer all your questions. But. Yeah, when you did the modeling, um, did you take any to consideration any of the Guyon, because we do know here, depending on the, the event we're seeing, it you know even though the river gauge may have the exact same uh, uh, flood level grade uh, of the river flow, depending on the type of event, how fast rain has come, uh, how long a duration, etc., the Guyon reacts differently and it uh, multiplies our problems here sometimes. Sometimes uh, Lamoille could be lower than the previous flood, but yet we get more flooding back into the, uh, the like the market or something because of the, the guy on. And I, I was very interested in some of your, because uh, I always wondered if, if we tried to increase capacity where the water could go, what effect it would have. Unfortunately, it's pretty minimal, but uh, the skate park land is town owned land. And on the Guyon is the uh, Chuckberry ball field, which is town owned. We could lower those areas very easily. It wouldn't require getting uh, landowner permissions. If we lowered them five feet, you know, does that make, is it worth taking all of that material out? Well, we did, a couple of questions. We didn't look at the floodplains on the Guyon. So that would be an initial, uh, we'd have to look at that up there. There is some modeling in place um, in that area, but it wasn't included in the study area. It was really specific up to the mills. Um, I think it would be worth looking. Um, you know, we, we know that tributaries in village, villages confluences create an awful lot of trouble. So this model, um, it's a 
steady state model, which means that there's one flow kind of that goes through um, at all times. And it accounts for the guy on additional flow coming in, but um, for each model run, we pick what flow we're running it at. So, you know, we're representing the 100 year, the 1% chance for current interval for this. So it assumes that the Guyon and the Lemoyne are both having the 100 year flow at this time. It's just kind of a standard way of doing it. We also modeled the 10 year, the 50 year, the 500 year. So it doesn't get into all the variations. We just had to pick one to do the analysis or a few to do the analysis. What's the rough flow rate you're talking about? Um, let's look it up in our handy dandy report here. I don't want to misquote. I think I passed it. Oh no, this is not it. Sorry. <laughs> so we did the report in a format that actually was quite so for the 100 year flood, um, right in this area, we're talking about 18,900 cubic feet per second. And can you translate that into a uh, foot? Or this, the flood gauge that you're talking about is the one that dogs had falls? Is that cubic feet? That's cubic feet per second? Mm -hmm. 18,000? So an uh, acre, 43,560 feet, one foot feet. Fill up pretty quick. So I just, I question how taking out a farmer's field is gonna make a huge difference. Well, it makes the amount of difference that we have on the table, which is less than half a foot. If you're only looking at water, if you start to look at some of the other benefits or some of the lower floods, um, you know, there's additional benefits. And does this, you know, ever get looked at? Is there a slice where you look at it and say, how does this deal with the TMDL? You know, do they? Um, do you want to answer that, Seth? Yeah. Do you want to answer that? Sure. Okay. Sure. So I'm Seth Jensen from the Memorial County Planning Commission. I apologize for coming in late. I had another community meeting before this. So um, there's def a definite. Um, benefit to uh, phosphorus and sediment uptake from floodplain uh, restoration. Um, the University of Vermont is in the process of sort of trying to quantify that in a more predictable uh, manner, but that is a that is a component of this. Um, you know, we're really focused on the floodplain levels for, for this piece because that was sort of what was the driving force of this initial work. Um, but the there's definite um, there are definite benefits to like Champlain TMDL, um, as well as just ice jamming and other benefits um, that go beyond just the, the immediate flood benefit. Um, I do want to quickly answer Eric's question about the Guyon. So this study, this this particular study was funded through our Brownfields program, um, and so because of that, it needed to be tied very specifically to the Manchester lumber site and the uh, Talc Mill site. Um, if there's interest in the community in exploring further up the Guyon and that ball field particular, particularly, we could talk about uh, ways to do that and um, it, you know, find, finding, finding the funding and resources to do that. It definitely, the Guyon is obviously part of the, the puzzle here for, the, for Main Street and the village as a whole. Um, we just needed to focus on the you know, the areas with the clear brown fields for, for this particular source. But um, every tributary, every section we add just improves the quality of the model everywhere. So with the focus being on the brown field, this is really uh, almost like uh, economic development. If we, <laughs> if there is going to be some uh, ability to use these properties at some point in time, normally you're, I heard you say one or two feet of capping, so this really is uh, a segment of how we could get ourselves into utilizing these properties down the road. It's, uh, right. It's so to get your the, the state approvals for capping 
putting fill on either of those sites in the areas that are in the floodplain, you're going to need to show a no net rise. Um, and this, this model is really the critical piece of, of demonstrating that no net rise. Um, because then your other only other option for dealing with it, site testing does confirm that there's contaminated soils out there would be excavating and sending to a, a, a landfill, which could be, you know, multiple or exponentially more expensive than capping in place. So that was sort of the driver of, sort of the initial driver of why a ground rules program would look at this. Um, but it definitely provides information that will make it significantly easier when the time comes for redevelopment of either of those sites or remediation of the soil issues to move, to move forward. It's a great piece to have. <laughs> In my mind, that might be the only reason to move forward if there's a benefit from an economic standpoint. I, I'm sorry, but I just don't see a project like this helping us with a flood situation. Not, not in a significant manner, and I just don't think it's enough. That's my personal opinion. But if there's an economic reason for it, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think the other benefits are lower. So if there's a significant amount of water that comes down the Lamoille River and the areas that would be available for reconnection are relatively small compared to that. I mean, mm -hmm. your, your example of an acre with one foot over is a great kind of way to put it in your head. Do you know when you're getting the uh, crowd study on the ice chain? And we are going to be sharing this data with them. So just to, to continue on, I have a few final slides. Um, as I mentioned, that final alternative where we place two feet of fill in all the redevelopment areas and then cut the um, floodplain restoration areas all down to the 10 year um, water surface elevation was our preferred alternative. And this shows, again, the results of doing that for the 100 year um, flood on the, in the first column. And then we also looked at the 500 year flood um, for that scenario. You know, as we know, the 100 year flood is becoming more common, 500 year flood is becoming, you know, the, the new 100 year flood a lot of, in a lot of situations. Um, and, you know, there are ice jamming and other results in water surface elevation is going to be a lot higher than, than just with the water coming down the river. And here you do see, you know, for the, the water surface elevation, you do start to get a little higher decreases down to the project area, you know, up to three tenths, four tenths, six tenths of a foot down at the end of the project area. You know, so the, the difference does get bigger as the flood gets bigger, um, which is important to know. Um, again, we looked at the velocities as well, and similar as before, you do see small increases in places, but local, local to those floodplain restoration areas, you are seeing decreases again in the velocities, you know, almost, almost a foot per second in this flood, first floodplain restoration area, you know, and then less so as we go through the project area. So then we just wanted to show um, what those results look like from the preferred alternative and also what that looks like specific to the redevelopment areas. So again, we have here, the blue is our updated existing 100 year floodplain and the yellow is the 100 year floodplain from the preferred alternative. So as you can see, it's not, there is not a huge difference. Um, you, know, you see right on the edges up here, decreases a little bit, you know, it's just in the field, doesn't make a huge difference. Um, you know, it's still largely the same through here. This is assuming that this area is all cut down. Um, the important point to show here is that this red hatching on redevelopment areas two and three is where there would be a flood bench put in closer to the river on those sites. So that's the area that would be required to offset a fill area farther away from the river on those sites. So you would cut down close to the river and then fill farther away from the river. Um, 
and that's the area that those would look like, which then corresponds to, you know, in this case, the, the blue of the existing 100 year flood elevation, then it all gets contained in that flood bench on that site, for example. So it is making a difference to the inundation extents in that, in that scenario. Did you study the uh, soil contents in those areas? No. No, so, you know, as Seth described, you know, there'd be additional analysis on the actual redevelopment sites to quantify contamination levels and locations. Um, so the idea would be that, um, you know, hydraulically, that's what you would need to be able to go forward with permitting you know, from the river toward or floodplain perspective, but we didn't get into the soil contaminant. I believe that's the next step. That, that would be pending sort of permission from the property owner, in which case the town and the village for the tap mill and the Manchester's for the Manchester lumber. But the feedback that we got from the, phase, from the uh, we haven't done a phase one yet, but from the area-wide plan from the Agency of Natural Resources was that before moving forward with that piece, we needed a H and H report, which is what, what this is, um, to confirm that soils could be moved around on site or capping could occur on site. Um, because that really, without increasing flood levels downstream, because that really would impact the, um, how you would manage soils. So, so that, that was the sequencing that was given to us by a &R. Um, and And you've, you've um, what you know from this is that you can do that kind of capping in place um, with some soil movement probably, you know. Um, and because this is a, a village center, um, there is under the eye rules some ability to move soils that are contaminated as long as they stay on site. So doing that cut, fill, cap, yeah, is a lot, um, but it didn't make sense to do that that those types of soil tests until we cleared this fertile. Um, but that's the next step if any of the property owners are want to move forward with it, or when they want to move forward with it. You know, you talked about a nine foot cut in the very beginning. Are all these cuts going to have riprap and large rock and boulders and everything capping the whole cut on the sides and on the bottom? If you don't do that, that's just going to cause more erosion. You're going to push down more earth. You're going to have more buildup in different places, and you're going to have a whole different water scenario down the line. You could actually make things worse by making cuts. Yes. Yeah, so um, you know we've actually done these in many different spots around the state, and. Um, this is probably a pretty good example. So you have the red area, which is the cut. So on Manchester Mill property. So the red area would be cut down, and then the rest of the site would be able to be filled and redeveloped or you know, to continue to use buildings that are there. This area, you're right, would be part of the river. Like it would be you know, allowed to flood. Um, the river could use it. So what we often do is along the new bank the new river bank back here is actually put the riprap back there and dig it down really deep kind of along where you're going to have your infrastructure and you know if this area if the river erodes into that part over time typically that's allowed that's the area that the river is using um, and the riprap wouldn't cover kind of the whole surface but it would be like a, a deep riprap um, Kind of wall back at the Have back. you done a financial analysis on your best case scenario? How much this whole thing would cost? We have not. No. This is going to be astronomical for your best case scenario. It could be very expensive. Yes. Yeah. And I think that that's why um, alternative seven is why we've talked about that a couple times as being a really good result of this study for you because what it means is that this area is a self-contained unit where you know you could do the cutting and a line of riprap and redevelop the site and with kind of a, a reasonable amount of cost without having to 
kind of go about and do all the other things we looked at also. So, you know, we're, you know, they're kind of self-contained pieces that, that work for the regulatory piece of it. Mm -hmm. So that work with our bodies during those cuts? Um, it depends where you are. So in this or one, yes, the other, I guess the C would be a problem. Mm -hmm. Would need to move it over. This one actually, I think it would stay on the other side of the river side of the road. <clears throat> this one would need to be looked into how that works. Right. You know. What was this one? Uh, that's a skate park. Right this is, yeah. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. There's multiple ways of dealing with that. One is kind of skirting the road around the back of the cut area, or just throw it up the reinforcing it, just throw it up. Yeah, it's not a little bit more. <laughs> if you were to pursue a funding application, at least for this as a flood mitigation, you know, for the, the cost, a cost benefit analysis of would be a requirement of that. It's just we're not at that phase yet. Um, so that would be something that would have to happen before. At least the those pieces would move forward. I, mean, I think that was the end of the formal presentation. We do have a, a kind of a big map, but you know, we just looked at the zoomed in areas um, on the previous slides. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to say, Seth, or? Sure, I would just say in terms of understanding sort of what the flood benches look like, how they function, um, it's not as big of a river, but um, in Jeffersonville, uh, underneath the new uh, Greenway Bridge next to the Route 15 park and ride, is sort of what you would be envisioning of um, what a flood bench looks like and how it functions. Um, and in that case, um, that work at least has been helping with some of the um, sedimentation in the river, of, of helping the river clean out uh, some of the sediment that's, that's um, built up. Um, in terms of the, the brown fields and, um, you know, some of that work could possibly conceivably be funded as part of the brownfields redevelopment and remediation funding. Um, but there's definitely an understanding that um, these are big things to do, and I don't think anyone uh, believes that the town would undertake 100% of the cost itself. Um, but the, you know, the, what we learned in Jeffersonville down the river is that that half a foot reduction can be very significant in a major, in a major event. Um, and so if whatever pieces of this you have interest in pursuing or understanding further, we're here to assist. And if you decide that you want to pursue other priorities at the moment, we'll help you with those priorities as well. We just, this is clearing a big hurdle for Manchester Lumber and Talc Mill uh, in terms of the ANR permitting when the time comes for that. Thank They didn't do the study, but mm -hmm. check the ball field. I mean, the, uh, arbor. Yeah, I mean, we could lower that. Yeah. So what if water goes in? Yeah, exactly. exactly. I know. I know. Well, it would just go in and then during a flood. The or dinner early enough, so it was just it finishing when I had to leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. close. I, I think that the, the trees and the lights are 
depending on flood level, <coughs> trees stand and or do not stand. I'm not talking about falling over, yeah. but it's different, completely different species. Yeah. Well, yeah. maybe. I, I mean, wouldn't be like mm -hmm. the river flow. Okay. Uh, oh, executive session. Is there any Thank other you, old business or anything that anybody want to bring up? Otherwise, I'd entertain a motion to enter into executive session. You have the motion wording? Right here. Uh, it's in the yeah. title here. The I move that okay. we enter executive session to discuss discuss communications by our attorney regarding collective bargaining unit as allowed by 1 BSA 313A1. Do we have a second? Nice job, Matt. Hey, thanks. <laughs> second. The motion is second. Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying go. All right. Uh, <laughs> opposed? I go. So go. <laughs> Uh, show us at 8.50, and you guys, are, you know, if we take any action afterwards, we'll let you know. Yeah, I think there's going to be action after the next one, uh, but it's...